learning of our students, then of course you are increasing their efforts, uh, their efforts results in more ability in theory as compared to the notion that aptitude is unchangeable. You can't really think like IQ is static, right? But what you really need to do is you have to, you have to find within the students what are the particular skills that you can actually nurture in them. So you cannot offhand say that because this is the first row, they're always the smartest kids as compared to the last uh, row kids, right? Because that, then you adopt the notion that their aptitude is unchangeable. From the beginning of your school year, they're sitting on the front row, they're always going to be the smartest kid. But instead, you're adapting the theories because you adhere to the possibility that from the first day of class, they're going to be the transformed and different from the last day of your classes. So that's your goal as a teacher. You want them transformed in the process of learning from your particular class. If I counted in all of the years that I have actually been a student, and I always tell myself I'm a perpetual student, lifelong learner, it's possible that I've had approximately 300 formal teachers. So I think if I did a statistical study of their different styles, classroom management, etc., you can already draw up some parallelisms that you can always remember the very good teachers and the very bad teachers. Those are the teachers that you will remember for the rest of your lives, correct? So obviously, we want to be the most impressionable good teachers that we could be in our students' lives. And of course, definitely the best accolade for a teacher is that when your student surpasses you and becomes an achiever better than you have ever been. So that is the reward of being an educator. So of course, <laughs> when, you're sure, uh, when you're already uh, striving for learning, it motivates the individuals to be engaged in activities with a commitment to learning. So that's what I'm saying, that from the very first day that you start teaching a particular course, it should lead you rationally, objectively, but with empathy as to how you want the students to be transformed by the end of your particular course of study or your program, or even if it's just a subject, or even if it's just a particular day or lecture, then you would have taken on the commitment of an educator. And definitely we have found that language itself is the tool by which we, can, we are able to actually reach our students. One of the challenges that I have taken on, and this was even um, after I had already decided to be in the education field is that I have special needs children in two opposite spectrum. One has giftedness and the other one has autism. So definitely the whole spectrum of educational needs need, need to be fulfilled in so far as how is the quality of education that they need in order to fulfill the needs that they have. And what I found out is that language itself is really one of the most complex abilities that can be acquired by children. So for a special needs child on the other end of the spectrum, which is that of an autistic child, if you could say one word and a gifted child would learn it immediately, it would have to take 100 or 200 times for you to repeat the same. So that whole spectrum of educational needs would have to be actually fulfilled by the educator. Of course, when you have uh, an educational policy as adopted, for example, by a department of education or, or a particular institution of learning, you're trying to see what's the middle ground. And that's what you're trying to deliver to the majority of your students. You would always have the slow learners. You will always have the fast learners. You will always have the average learners. And therefore, that's where these theories find its most applicability because then you can do peer teaching. You can do contextual learning. You can ask collaboration from your students in order to guide those who are on the other end of the spectrum, maybe the slow learners, can be aided and assisted by the fast learners. The front row students can then assist the last row students in that context. Next, please. So children learn, as I've already mentioned about the educational policy here. So children learn 
um, standard value and knowledge of society by raising questions and accepting challenges to find solutions that are not immediately apparent. So you will see this in any class. There would always be the natural leaders in the class. There would always be the fast learners. And so children, when we talk about development, um, it's an ongoing development and a lifelong learning process from children to adults. They would then be assisted when you find it in the context of learning in a particular environment. So other learning provides um, include explaining concepts, justifying the reasoning, and seeking information. So that's why the discussion between the learners is also very important when you have this design for your activities. And then, um, therefore, learning is a social process which requires social and cultural factors to be considered during instructional planning. And so when you're designing your specific lesson plan and the task and the activities, always use as a reference, for example, our cultural norm. So at breakfast, one of the professor, uh, Professor Demi, was asking me, what are you eating? So I was eating champorado. So of course, this is very new to him. It's the first time that he has been in the Philippines. So again, just as I would to a child, I would explain the process. What are the ingredients of this particular uh, recipe? And how is it actually made? So we do, as Professor Steve was saying, scaffolding and cumulative knowledge. Um, when you are taking on the child developmental concepts for learning. And the social nature of learning um, strives or drives the determination of the learning goals. Take into consideration always, not just the individual learning, but the context by which he's learning that particular knowledge, skills, aptitudes. Again, related to his own personal experience, his own personal community, region, and what is common between him and the others with whom he is learning that particular concept. Next would be learn, knowledge and learning are situated in a particular physical and social context. So we know why it is territorial when we say it's the Philippines. This is our educational policy. This is what is adopted by our Department of Education. And that's different if you go to another country. They have completely different educational policies. That's why we use that always as a reference when you're designing for instructional design and also for curricula, you look at that particular physical and social context. So if we consider English as a second language, it means that in most um, social contexts as well as learning contexts in the Philippines, we will be using English language. So it is actually imperative for us to have a higher level of proficiency. As I've mentioned, I'm teaching content courses, quantitative methods, um, legal concepts, and business law. So therefore, even though those concepts are coming from a foreign or a differently situated context, I have to adopt them as to how it is in the Philippines. So eventually, I also develop courses in Asian business systems or Philippine business environment as compared to internationalization and globalization because I have to draw on the references that if they were conducting business in the Philippines, it would be slightly different from how you would conduct business in the United States, even if we're using English as a common language of communication. Then the range of settings would include, I've already mentioned that it doesn't have to be within the context of the school. That's why if you enforce English only policy in the school, what you really want is not just for them to use English in the school, but if it is, it is at all possible to actually extend the usage outside of the school setting. So of course you will have the home, you will have the community, and you have the workplace. So, and the use of the English language in all of those contexts, because they really provide a social context for an individual in multiple contexts, 
therefore, there is a higher probability of increasing your proficiency when you have multiple usages and multiple contexts within which you're using the English language. So the choice depends on the purpose of instruction and the intended learning goals. Obviously, in the school, it's far easier for us to always set what are the learning goals that we have. But it's not so clear, for example, if you're in the workplace. There was a mention about the business process outsourcing business. It's a very big industry for us. And definitely what they focus on will be the spoken English language proficiency. They, they always emphasize pronunciation, enunciation, and the fact that Filipinos can have an accent neutral use of the English language, example, in comparison to the Indian call centers. So that's part of the proficiencies that they would like to have in that particular workplace. So if you're a student and you do intend, for example, to be connected to BPO industry, what would be needed would be a higher level of oral English language proficiency, even in comparison to the spoken or the written component of English language proficiency. So again, it depends on your intended goal. If you're obviously going to be a teacher for an English class, definitely the proficiency levels in all four components should be of a much higher level of proficiency if that's your major for secondary education. Next slide, please. So knowledge can be uh, viewed as distinct to the individual, other persons, and various artifacts such as physical and symbolic tasks and not solely as property of the individuals. So when you talk about like knowledge, if I say that I know the concept of the number two, that does not necessarily only belong to me because it doesn't make sense if it's just stored knowledge on my end and how then can I relate this concept unless I have social cognition or I have social interaction. So that's why I've observed this with special needs children, if they're autistic, they, there's a saying that they live in their minds or they're in their own world because they're less verbal or communicative, meaning they may understand the instructor or the instructions given to them, but it's difficult to have affirmation whether they have authentically understood what you're telling them because there's no feedback mechanism on their end. You don't know if they really understood. If you teach them number two, do they understand the concept? So that's why it's very often the, the teaching strategy will be to take tangible objects, two bananas, and show the concept of number two versus having a label of just number two being taught to the child, okay? So creating an assessment in a context help guides the teacher to replicate real world experiences and make necessary inclusive design decisions. I've already mentioned that. And of course, contextual learning can be learned in a uh, formative assessment and can help give education a stronger, um, stronger profile on how the intended learning goals, standards, and benchmarks for the curriculum. So that's the bigger part of it. You can either start with either the curricular design or the instructional design when you're looking at your intended learning goals. Okay? And it is essential next to establish and align the intended learning goals of the contextual task at the beginning of each um, of your courses so that you have a shared understanding on what success looks like. So the very last slide, okay, let's look at the gas concepts wheel. So this is just a visual representation of how we can adopt these two theories, okay? So there's always the goal, um, and then what will be the results and so on. So this is like what will be a conceptual idea and a visual imagery of what you need to go through when you're conducting your curricular design as well as your um, instructional design and eventually your intended learning goals. Okay, so um, do I still have five minutes? Do I have five minutes? Okay, now I'm going to ask our Japanese students so they arrived here on Sunday. It's the first time that they have been here in the Philippines and especially being immersed in an English language environment. 
So they're coming from a Japanese language environment and then they have their social exchange with our students. So they were with our university from Monday. And so on the very first day, all their activities were conducted with a specific Filipino student. So each one of them had a buddy on the very first day. So that student was like a guide. And then on the second day, they had another distinct set of students, new students again on the second day. But on the third day, both sets of students then became their guides. So they came together to collaborate. So I'd like to ask our Japanese students about their most memorable learning experience from these three days that they had student exchanges with the Filipino students using the English language and definitely using both the contextual learning theory as well as the functional literacy theory in English language learning because that's one of the intended learning goals for their conduct of a study visit to the Philippines, okay? So Sakura, can you please begin and share with our um, teachers your experience? Good morning. Good morning. Um, we are really happy to be here. Um, we are university students from Japan. Um, we came to Philippines for a study tour. Uh, I went to I went Balani. Um, I went Balani and I met special children. and all children in Philly have um, I think that the workers and all children are happy, are happy. Um, so impression in Philippines, um, different of culture. So in Japan, for example, in Japan, um, bus bathroom has hot water, but in Philippines, um, cold water only. Toilet ah. <laughs> so, um, uh, 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 in Japan. So, grow tissue, but in Philippines, so separate, so tissue and trash. So, I surprise, I got surprise, and I feel different of culture. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kako. My most impression is that uh, Philippines has uh, many traffic. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> but uh, in Japan has uh, many rules. So, but Philippines don't have the maybe has hasn't rules. So. Japan. These systems, um, 
we don't have this system in Japan, such as milk bank. So I surprised in Philippines child care. Thank you. Japanese people eat meat three, three times per day, but Filipinos eat five times per day. <laughs> so I'm so full every day. <laughs> Philippine student is very powerful and positive, but Japanese student is a little shy. So the I felt the culture is a little different. So thank you very much to our students from the Hirao School of Management in Konan University. So again. Um, I'd like to emphasize again our commitment. The Teachers Helping Teachers Organization is committed to providing our educational expertise to the educators and of course by, um, by extension to the students of those educators in the Asia Pacific region. So again, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity as we um, well celebrate our, 12th, our 10th group from uh, Japan and also the second time that we have been invited here in Cebu. So again, see you again, and maraming salamat po. Thank you. Any questions about, um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Amihan, for that um, talk about uh, functional literacy and contextual learning theory. Who has any questions? 